Welcome to Y1 TV, the Mark Show. And today, I found a guest. I actually found this woman through a mutual friend, Sean Smith. Obviously, we're going to talk today about her story, her journey, celebrating World Mental Health Day, which is on Sunday, this Sunday, coming Sunday. It's quite appropriate that Beck Melville joins me on the show. Welcome, Beck. Hi, Mark. So grateful for the opportunity to chat to you today. Yeah, so you've actually um, helped me out with a couple of guests recent times, Dan Jackson and Brett Burton, who have fabulous stories and story of uh, a lot of wisdom, a lot of journey, different lifestyles, different careers, but uh, really all pointing back to you, which is really important. So first of all, I want to say welcome, but the Beck Melville story, B-E-C-K, by the way, Beck Melville story is about you as a little girl and what were you doing as a young woman, young girl, which brought you to today? That's a big start, but we'll start there. Oh, how, how long have you got? Mark? Oh, it's about 40 minutes. Kind of right. <laughs> okay, the quick version. I've got to remember yeah. the quick version. Um, that's, that's a really fascinating question, actually. And, and I love it because joining the dots backwards and, and actually reflecting why I'm doing what I'm doing now. But yeah, that's fascinating. Okay, so let's go there. <laughs> let's go there. I am a twin. I have a twin brother. I was born um, to two beautiful parents, Ken and Dot, and they already had three children. And 12 years later, in their mid 40s, they had twins. So I was, I was as surprised, we'll call, um, as was my twin brother. I feel very grateful for my upbringing. Um, you know, we weren't, we weren't rich, we weren't poor. We just were, were happy and um, had lots of opportunities to, to do things. I think that was my parents' philosophy that, you know, didn't want to force us into any particular hobby or sport, but just gave us opportunities to do that. I found a lot of happiness in 16 years of ballet, actually. So I, uh, I think it gave me discipline and some confidence and obviously um, kept me fit back then, which was, which was really important. Um, always had, you know, good friends, always aspired to be I'm like one of my older brothers, actually, like really kind. I always saw how they connected and treated people. And I, I guess that was an early influence for me. I, I don't know. I just always look for moments of um, how to create joy, you know, understood that life wasn't all a bed of roses, but, uh, you know, how could you get back to that place of joy when you needed to? And I think to try to answer your question about, you know, what, you know, fast forward, I won't say how many years, Mark, we're not going there today. No, we're not. No, not <laughs> but, <all>. Fast <laughs> not forward here, I think, I think the alignment is that, you know, I continue to try to, you know, bring joy, find joy. I think I continue to be known as someone who's kind and, and you know, that reflects on um, how I show up for people. And I, I try to use my strengths. So I try to do the things that I do best and I enjoy doing, knowing that that's going to add to the quality of my life and life satisfaction and my well-being. I hope I got the question right. right. It, it was, there's a lot of things that have happened in there between, uh, between then and now. We can actually flush it out because I was reading your profile. If you had a chance after people see this interview, go to beckmelville.com and have a, list, have a look at Beck's profile, just about her as a person. And, and I, there's a quote here. Uh, I was working in a space that used a, a deficit-based leadership and coaching model focused on what people were not doing or what they were doing wrong. Okay, mm -hmm. so when did, that, when did the penny drop for you to say to yourself, because it's all about self-discovery, and we spoke off air about what, what I discovered about energy and people and about the environment you live in, the things you do, and bring in joy to have other people. So when was the moment that you thought, light bulb moment, ah, I've got to go down a different path. What what happened at that point? Okay, so we'll, we'll fast forward past my structured finance career, my six years in South Africa, where I came back to Melbourne with two babies. And I thought, you know, lack of continuity of career, what am I going to do? And uh, as I uttered those words, someone who I'd worked with many, many, many years prior, who was a leadership consultant, happened to phone me. You know, if you believe in things happen for a reason at the right time, that yeah. portal opened and that's what happened. So this great guy, James, his name was, he rang and he said, Beck, we used to consult to you, you used to be our client. We used to teach leadership in, in the business you worked for. I see you back from South Africa. Would you be interested in doing some leadership development with me? You can be a coach, a consultant, a trainer. You know, you haven't got um, necessarily training in that, but I've seen you as a practitioner in the leadership space and I want you on board. It so happened that he was ex-SAS military and an organisational psychologist. 
So if I can give you the vision, if anyone's ever watched the SAS TV show that's on at the moment yeah. where you're out in the bush, the first time I was ever away from my children when they were three and four, I was five days in an immersive leadership learning program in the bush at SAS style. And uh, <laughs> two hours sleep, minus three degrees, lying in the bush, being ambushed, all sorts of things. But to answer your question, Mark, at that stage, I could see that, you know, what he was doing was enriching people's lives and they were having those moments of self-discovery, but it was all much like the SAS show. What's wrong with you? How can you fix it? You're weak. And it was trying to break them down to build them up. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I guess, intuitively went, that just doesn't feel quite right. And once again, next portal door opened. I discovered the field of positive psychology, neuroscience, emotional intelligence, and I found that where most of us will spend 80% of our time trying to fix our weaknesses and, and what have you, and only 20% on our strengths, and that's what the research is showing us, that actually there's a good solid argument, evidence-based argument to say that maybe we should be focused 80% on our strengths and only 20% on our weaknesses. And I, I guess at that moment, you know, as those two worlds collided, the XSAS deficit-based and, you know, how do we get from minus 10 to zero like clashed or, or collided with, well, actually, how do we get to thriving? How do we go past that to try not to be a perfect 10, but to, to move towards that in the best way we can and try to care for our well-being using a different lens about, you know, what we're grateful for, um, what our strengths are. And when I start to talk about that, often Mark, people go, oh, that's all the fluffy stuff. But I promise you, if you scratch the surface, there's so much evidence to say that, um, that there's, a, there's a great argument to show up that way and to be focused on those things. And we know the power of mindset. You, you speak to lots of sports people, you know that. And um, you even see a lot of the philosophies and the research I'm talking about um, show up in, in the sporting arena now in terms of you know coaching and you know how you actually get the best out of people the thing is also i mean i have an interest in buddhism right and it's about the positivity and people and energy and all those sort of things right is the world this this won't go too deep but I'm, i like touching on it because it's a touchy subject right is it the world <laughs> is the world coming around to think rather than half glass empty Let's get half glass full. Is it in your, because you talk about neuroscience, which is really big for me. I, I really love the subject, non-duality. Do you, do you think that the world is starting to, in your travels or in your studies or in your work, which we'll talk about, is it, do you think that um, people are changing their mindset about that? <laughs> That's a really um, interesting question, given the times we're living in, because yeah, you know, it is. I mean, if we talk about neurologically, our brain is wired to look out for error, fault, what's wrong. Yeah. And so, you know, we don't need to focus on doing that because automatically we go there. I think what's happening is that with the emerging science around well-being and neuroscience and positive psychology, we can have a greater awareness about what is going right, what's working well. And even, you know, when I coach people, I can say, how's it going? And they'll go straight to, I've had a crap day, I'm whatever. I go, okay, so let me ask what I call a generative question. What's working well at the moment? And even for those people who are struggling, they can often find just one small thing that's working well, which is enough to, you know, see it in their mind that, okay, not, not everything's as, as bad. So are people waking up to that? I, I think, there's a desire to um, knowing that that serves us better to, to you know, to be aware of, of what we do need to fear and, and whatever, but also to be aware of the, the great stuff that is around us. Um, yeah. I'll read a quote off you. Uh, small Another action. quote. Now I'm scared. <laughs> but, but, no, it's on your website. It's all good. Um, small, <laughs> action, small actions, big impact. Be happy, be yeah. kind, be grateful. Tell me some of the work you're doing at the moment with some people or organizations where you're putting these things into practice, because I think, I think what you do is fantastic. Um, you know, it's amazing work. And I think there should be, I think there should be more of it because I think that um, we can't stay half glass empty. We've gone through a pandemic, which is tough, but let's try and stay, look at the positives. It's like a, life's like a reset. We've finished and now we're restarting. So it's a good time to get Beck Melville involved with your organization, with people to try and, Talk about the positive aspects, some of the things you're doing at the moment, Beck, you know, with different people, organisations. Yeah, okay. So, um, well, I like to keep busy and I, I get to work with some amazing people in this field. Once again, just reminding people who are listening today, this is not happyology. This is a science of well-being. 
the science of thriving. And um, as I said, I'd like to always say there's, there's research that supports, you know, anything that I'm saying today. So, you know, uh, be happy, be kind, be grateful. That's just a, a, a mantra. I had gone and done some studies at Melbourne Uni, a postgrad in applied positive psychology. And um, they were words that really resonated with me, the science of kindness, the science of gratitude um, and the science of happy. Happy is, happy is an interesting one because we can split it in two ways. We can call it hedonic happiness, which is, hey, down at the pub with your mates having a beer, you know, you've got some um, hedonism happening, you've got some happiness there. And then we've got happiness that comes from deep meaning and a sense of understanding your purpose, who you serve, what difference you make. So when I say be happy, it's it's two, two uh, sides of the one coin there. And the other quote that you read out to me, what did you, what else be, did I? What be, I hot, be, hot, be happy, be kind, be grateful. Yeah, that's so, the one I've just covered. Yeah. And what was the other one? that? Small actions, big impact. Oh, small actions, big impact. Okay, so small, and, and then I'll come to the work I'm doing with people. Small actions, big impact. There's lots of research. There's a great book called Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg. And it talks about, Quite often, you know, if we're talking about how we get from deficit to the other side, people think it's a, you know, a massive life change and, you know, it's it's insurmountable to even make those changes. And what we know is that if we just start small, even the smallest well-being habit can start to instill some really good practices that snowball into, you know, into something that allows us to, to live with a sense of well-being. So, um, yeah, yeah, small actions, big impact. I love that. And people often talk about the butterfly effect that, you know, the, the beat of a butterfly's wing can cause, you know, whatever over the other side of the world. So I think it's, it's drawn from that philosophy as well. And, you know, I think if we chunk things down and make them manageable for people in habits and, and their well-being and changes they want to make, it becomes more accessible and people are more likely to action it. So that's why I quote that. So the work I do, I uh, work with an organization called the Wellbeing Lab. We run certificates in creating well-being um, globally. It's just incredible, the amazing people who show up and they show up from all walks of life. I've got one gentleman who's a lecturer, a university professor in uh, Ethiopia. He's trying to make a difference over there. I've got a teacher in Singapore who's trying to introduce well-being there. I've got corporates such as Zero, and you know who are trying to create positive workplaces, knowing how much we uh, time we spend in the work. Place. And when I say in the workplace, I don't necessarily mean in person nowadays, but, you know, involved with the people we have to work with. So I'm involved in that. I get to do some amazing work with an organization called the Oranges Toolkit, which tell is me, a social Tell enterprise. me about that. I was interested Oh, in yes, that. that's... Yes, that's very, I've jumped the gun there, Mark. So the Oranges Toolkit is the social enterprise of Camp Quality, Australia's uh, leading uh, children's cancer foundation. And so the profits from the workshops that we run on resilience and wellbeing actually go back to fund the activities for, for Camp Quality. And, and even that's a fascinating story. Many, many years ago, they noticed that the volunteers and the people working at Camp Quality you know, who are working in the toughest of environments. So if you want to get a tough environment, look at that, um, you know, working with children and family with cancer diagnosis, and they wanted to bring their optimism levels up and their resilience so that they were better equipped to, to do the important work they needed to do. And it was found through the, the training that they actually moved people from one place to a better place. I'm not saying the perfect 10 out of 10 in wellbeing, but a better place. Um, and of the success of those internal programs, those programs were then marketed out to corporates and sponsors so they could learn how to improve and care for their well-being and resilience. So um, that's some other stuff that I'm involved in. So I'm on the board there. And then, you know, I've got some direct clients that I coach and run workshops for, albeit via Zoom now. We've become very, very familiar with this environment. But um, yeah, just, you know, sharing information, sharing knowledge and sparking well-being conversations is, uh, is really what I do. And talk. I talk a lot. And listen. I listen a lot, though, too, Mark. <laughs> just, um, I've just actually picked something up. How do I become... How does a person become a kindness advocate? A <laughs> kindness advocate. <laughs> uh, well, actions speak louder than words is my starting point on that, Mark. I actually, I feel quite geeky now. At Melbourne Uni, I did my thesis on kindness. <laughs> so I actually studied kindness. And what I did learn is that um, a lot of people think that kindness is soft and fluffy. And I've actually come to learn that kindness is much like Brene Brown says, kind is clear, 
Kind is um, having conversations that people call difficult conversations. I call them kind conversations because you respect and value people enough to speak to them, not about them. Kindness can be about doing good deeds and, and small acts of kindness and enhancing other people's lives. So if you want to try any of those out, that's how you start to, to be a kindness advocate. Although I, I pretty much think, Mark, from what I know about you, you're pretty kind already. And the other side of that, there's always two sides to the coin, kindness to self. It's a big one, right? And especially during these times, the ability to show kindness to self or self-compassion is really, really crucial. So I think we're much better at showing kindness to others sometimes than kindness to ourselves. but there's some really fascinating research around why we should be doing that, especially during these times as well. Self-compassion. Do you know what? Yes. If you go through life and you walk through life and it's a bit of philosophy for me. You go walk through life and you meet a whole lot of people and you, you know, when you have the sort of person that people are drawn to you because the energy you put out there and a lot of people aren't self-compassionate to themselves. So how do we as people, um, it's a bit of psychology coming back and I know you have a huge interest in it. How do people become self-aware so they give themselves more self-compassion? Because that's a really important factor in life, I think. I'll reference, um, not to get geeky with the research, but Kristen Neff, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-N-E-F-F. -F. If people want to go and jump on her website, they'll get a lot more facts and details about how they might do that. But her research talks to, we need to be mindful, first of all, about how we are to ourselves, how we treat ourselves. We, you know, have to be aware that if we make a mistake or we don't get it right, quite often we beat ourselves up. That inner critic comes out. And so being mindful about that is a good starting place. Like what's the voice inside our head when things don't go to plan or when we're struggling? Because I also want to say that struggle is very much part of well-being. It's not a different concept. So anyone struggling out there, we're all good. We can still try to thrive even in the, in the presence of struggle. The second piece to her model is that uh, we speak to ourselves like a kind and wise friend or a kind and wise coach. So it doesn't mean letting yourself off the hook necessarily. It just means really understanding that, you know, the fact of our, our common humanity is that we're going to not get it right sometimes. So, you know, speak to ourselves in such a way that um, a kind and wise coach or friend might. And then I guess the other part, I've just alluded to it, is actually recognising our common humanity and that we're all going to bump up against our limitations sometimes. You know, they're really the secret ingredients to starting to be more self-compassionate. And what they find, and um, once again with sporting people, that if we do beat ourselves up, we don't get the time we want, or we don't, um, you know, play the game we want, or we don't do the work we wanted. If we beat ourselves up, it inhibits our ability to achieve our goals. Whereas if we actually speak to ourselves um, with that sense of self-compassion, once again, not letting ourselves off the hook, the research has started to show that we're more likely to brush ourselves off and get up and try again. So there's so much in there, Mark, that I could unpack with you, but hopefully that gives you a sense of how you can start to cultivate some self-compassion. So I suppose it's about um, people having a self, you have to get to the point where you get enough pain in your life or you want to change, have a change and you become self-aware that you're asking different questions of yourself to yeah. get a, a different result, you know. Uh, you know, yeah. and, that, and that's a really good thing. Yeah. And Mark, my hope would be that if people can put the self-compassion into practice now, they will never get to that stage where, you know, they're flat on the floor going, what next? But, you know, it's a, we're all, I teach the stuff because I need the stuff. So, uh, yeah, we're all work in progresses, I guess. Yeah, I just come back to the, the well-being lab, which is obviously where the research is and, and people coming from all different walks of life. It, it's a really encouraging thing to think that people are, are coming to a place called the Wellbeing Lab to get information about uh, how to be better leaders or better corporate people. So you're getting people from all walks of life in there, which is really good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so my speciality in happy places is probably in corporates because I, I worked in corporate for so long. But, you know, you've got uh, oh, Teachers Australia. You've got people from all walks of life. You've got independent consultants who are trying to make that, um, have that positive impact. But, yeah, you've got, oh, I, I mean, you've got financial advisors. You've got, you know, you name a career and uh, they're sitting at the, around the table just trying to understand how... We live our best lives, I guess. That sounds very life coachy. It's a little bit more than that. But yeah, fascinating and encouraging is what I'd say. 
Now, on some sports people. That's how we got onto Brett. That's how I met Brett Burton because he's a participant. So we've even got ex footy players sitting around the table. There you go. Which, which is really good because this both Daniel and Daniel Jackson and Brett Burton had amazing stories. And you know, yeah. Daniel travelled the world and talks about his experience with people. And you know, he was he was a bit of a left of centre type person where he wasn't. Yes, he was. He wasn't the conformist as he wasn't your typical AFL player. In fact, he he talks about in the in the interview he talks about. He actually wasn't quite sure whether he liked the game, but just tried to fit in and then found this self-discovery, which is a great story, which is what we all like, you know, in the end, try and do, try and find ourselves. But this Sunday yes. is World Mental Health Day. What is, is that? Have you got any thoughts about what that, um, what that means stands for? Yeah, so, so it's October is Mental Health Month. Sunday is Mental Health Day. And, of course, we've got other events that happen throughout the year are you okay day you know my thoughts on this mark and i was reflecting on this thinking you might ask about it is i love that a day like that day brings awareness to mental health because we get stuck in our busyness and and we get on with our lives and you know some of us know people who are um, struggling with their mental health and and you know others maybe don't have that vicinity with people who do so the one thing i'd say is i love the awareness it brings but i you know, my greatest wish and my greatest hope, and this is through lived experience and uh, knowing people who have really struggled with their mental health, is that, you know, it's not a, a an event. It's a conscious thing that we're thinking about all day, every day. So when we interact with anyone at the supermarket, you know, instead of judging how someone's behavior behaving, actually getting curious about what might be going on for them or, you know, where their mental health might sit. And, you know, mental health is a broad term right we're talking about people with actual diagnosis and we're talking about people who are just having a crap day right so their mental health might not be as buoyant as it would be other days so what does it mean for me i i want it to be a a line in the sand that people step over and go well actually mental health is everyone's business and mental health is something that i should be considering all day every day either myself or for others and you know how do i take some of the evidence and the research and put it into practical ways that I can enhance my mental health, but also, you know, share that information with other people. So there you go. That's that's what it represents for me. That's not bad. And you know what? You're in a good space. As you said, you studied at Deakin, Melbourne Uni, about the whole thing about um, well-being, about um, how people live their lives. And you walk, worked in a corporate world and got to a point where is there might, that many stories out there with people who have got to a point working 100 hours a week you know, 12 hours a day, stressed to the max because they think that is the only way to live their life until they get to That was to me. Enough, until, that's right. That was you. Until you get enough pain and you go, I've had enough of this. And then look for the wellbeing label. Look for Beck Melville. Make sure you go to beckmelville.com. Have a look. Have a look at some of Beck's work she's done. Amazing site jobs. But there's some quotes that you wrote which are really uh, resonate with me and re resonate with people watching the show. Working hard for something you don't care about is called stress. Working hard is something we call love is called passion. Uh, that was from Simon Sinek. Is that how you say it? Great Simon quote. Sinek, yes, yes. Great That's quote. That's right. And one of the greatest people that you probably obviously been to South Africa and all those sort of things. There's no passion to be found in living a life that is less than one you are capable of living, Nelson Mandela. That's a really passionate and really forthright saying and quote and um it's really a good mantra to live by there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're not going to have time to go into it today, but, you know, there is a well-being framework and one of the pillars of well-being that sits within that is having meaning. And, you know, we, I think we've all, well, I won't say all, you know, some people have always worked in, in um, jobs and careers that, uh, that light them up and they're passionate about. But for many, they'll know that feeling of, oh my gosh, this is just a means to an end, get me out of here. And I think, you know, even having that realization, especially during these times and, and going and doing stuff that you love, you absolutely love, um, is so, so important for our well-being amongst a lot of other, you know, ingredients that I throw into the mix. But just to those quotes, uh, yeah, that's why they resonate with me. That's why I love them. And I, you know, I can seriously say at the time I loved what I did with finance. And, and when I reflect on it, it was more the people I love, not the numbers. I can do them, but you know, not my you know, preference. Um, but I can genuinely say what I do nowadays. Um, and the people I meet along the way, it lights me up every day. I feel so fortunate to, to be doing this work. So you wake up every day, Beck, and you say to yourself, 
Um, you're grateful for a start because you're alive and you're still breathing and uh, and you've got two arms, two legs, too, like you can see and hear, smell. Yeah. But um, you wake every, up every day and I think that what you're trying to pass on to people is amazing work. It's amazing stuff. If you want to, before I let you go, is there anything you want to share or, or you know, provide to the people watching the show or, you know, something you want to leave us with? Because um, I want to make sure that I cover off the great work that you're doing, um, the, the thing the point you got to in your life where you thought I've done that and I have to change my life because of my own health, which is really important. Is there anything you want to share before I let you go? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so many things, but I, I'm just going to look left to my board because I'm very, I'm very visual and I, I love having prompts around me yep. to remind me of this stuff, you know, just, just in case I forget, but there is one thing that um, I read every morning I come into my study and it says, who do I want to help? What contribution do I want to make? And how can I best spend my time to make sure that happens? And sometimes the answer is I need to focus on me. And for many um, moments, it's about, you know, how, how can I have that impact and, and uh, support others in caring for their well-being as well? So I'd probably finish off on that note. BeckMelville.com. Make sure you have a look at the website. It's amazing. Her, her profile is amazing. Some of the work she does and what she stands for is amazing stuff. So, uh, everybody on A1 TV, The Mark Show, make sure you have a look at beckmelville.com. Beck, thanks for joining me on the show. It's been really a pleasure. It's great to meet you in, uh, not in person, but on Zoom. And um, maybe one day on a track we can, we can meet through other people or whatever. But thanks for joining me. Okay, thanks so much, Mark. Take care. Cheers.